Hello, and welcome to this talk entitled Should We or Not Create Strong AI? An important question connected with that is could we create strong AI, and if it is possible, could we actually decide not to? Um, the subtitle of the uh, talk is Why AI Compares with Plagues in Nuclear War, which might give you an idea of the direction where I'm coming from. At the Future of Humanity Institute, uh, where I work, um, we define existential risks as risks plausibly likely to annihilate Earth-based intelligence life or permanently curtail its potential. Amongst the uh, existential risks, the sort of top five we're looking at, at the, uh, for the moment are no particular order, pandemics, synthetic biology, uh, nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, and nuclear war. Not included on this list are things like asteroid impact and environmental collapse, simply because in relative terms these are just not dangerous enough. So today I'm going to be focusing in on artificial intelligence. And you might take askance, why is this considered to be dangerous? Why is it indeed an existential risk? Well, first to answer any questions, what do the experts say? Let's have a look at them. Unfortunately, experts don't have exactly the best track record. This is the Dartmouth Conference in 1956, essentially predicting that artificial intelligence could be made over the summer. This is Dreyfus nine years later, um, suggesting that the top of the achievements of computers uh, was imminent. I think it's safe to say that neither of these predictions have been entirely borne out in practice. Here are some more AI predictions. AI will be developed in 15 to 25 years. Um, you may want to guess when this was made. Well, in fact, it was made by various people in 2012. Also, 2011, 2010, 2009, 2008, 2007, 6, and a whole host of dates all the way back to the 1960s. I'm hoping we can uh, perform better than this. And the first question is to ask, why, is, why are the predictions so terrible? Well, let's have a look at other fields where predictions exist. Um, this is the XKCD cartoon, which arranges fields by purity, with the purest fields sneering at the least pure ones. Uh, by a convenient coincidence, this is also approximately things arranged by predictability, how strong and accurate the predictions are. If a physicist tells you something about the result of an experiment, he'll be quoting three significant figures. If a, a sociologist or a psychologist say something, the predictions will be a lot less accurate and a lot less likely to come true. I've added in economists and historians on the graph. Now, why is there such a difference in the quality of predictions? Well, mainly because the different fields have access to different tools. Mathematicians are lucky enough to be able to use deductive logic um, others have stronger or weaker uh, versions of the scientific methods, down to the poor historians who are reduced to nothing else but past examples. But where should AI prediction lie on this graph? Well, there is a convenient hole down there in the left, and indeed AI predictors lie down here because they don't even have past examples to rely on since no one has actually built an AI. So they're relying on nothing but expert opinion, which is considerably worse than any of the other tools here. So the question arises, when are experts good? When do experts good get predictions? This is from James Shanto, who noted that the performance of experts tended to vary more depending on the field in which they were working rather than what, which particular expert you had. Um, the qual their quality or their training. So, for instance, uh, in medicine, anesthesiologists uh, would be quite good and uh, 
many of the mammogram interpreters uh, wouldn't uh, because their fields have different things of good performance or poor performance, especially um, where feedback is concerned. Now, feedback is probably the most important thing distinguishing a good field or field where it's a good from a poor one. Two other important ones are whether experts agree or disagree on their stimulus and other aspects of it, and whether the problem is decomposed or not. Where AI predictions are concerned, we're probably stuck with this, where almost all the features are the ones that should lead to poor performance. Interestingly enough, one of the major ones that could lead to better performance is whether the field is decomposable or not, and it could be decomposed, but unfortunately very rarely is. So this is the theory. What do we see in practice? Well, here I've plotted various prediction dates for uh, AI's arrival, made by some experts and non-experts, and also the date at which the prediction was made. You can distinguish Turing's original prediction here and the AI winter here, where no one was talking about AI anymore. And the thing that strikes me upon looking at this is just how spread out they are. The difference between any of those two bars is 20 years, and they are just spread out all over the place with no real difference between experts and non-experts, and no real indication that there's any sort of convergence on any value, uh, some genuine sign of expertise. Now this is the cartoon version of disagreements and overconfidence, because we've seen that AI experts strongly disagree. When we reach an opinion, we base it on a lot of things, life experience, evidence, detailed arguments, and a variety of other stuff. And let's be honest, some, also some biases and rationalizations. And this reads, leads to a reasonable conclusion. What about the other people, the people who disagree with us? Well, they're doing exactly the same thing. Except from within our minds, this is all we can see. So no matter how much it feels that our estimate is correct, and that everybody else's estimate is superficial, this cannot tell us that we are indeed correct, because that is what we expect to see, in whether or not we're correct. So that means that just because the AIs are uh, AI experts are disagreeing all over the place, that doesn't mean that our own intuitions are any more correct. Our performance on AI prediction is likely to be just as good as an expert's, which means utterly terrible. But let's look into AI itself more. Why could it be a potential risk? Well, don't think of the Terminator, which is basically just a big muscle and no brain. As this picture shows here, uh, the dominant species is not the one with the big muscles. This is the model of a chimp brain, or a picture of a chimp brain, next to a picture of a human brain, the scale. Chimps have a population of about 200,000 and use basic wooden tools. Humans have heavy industry, uh, nuclear bombs, and we've spread across almost the whole surface of the Earth. And since we've augmented our powers with computers, our intellects with computers, we've developed hydrogen weapons, landed on the moon, and had unprecedented economic growth. So the question of what could happen with intelligence is if we have an AI that takes the next step up, what transformations it could write, it could uh, do. My preferred model of what sort of AI you could get with purely human level uh, artificial intelligence is, is you could create, say, a super committee of the AI, Edison, Einstein, George Soros, Clinton, Oprah, Plato, Goebbels, Steve Jobs, and Bernie Madoff give them vast databases uh, and network them together running at thousands and thousands of times human speed. This entity that you could create with just by copying and training human level AIs would probably consider that the internet and the human race are just useful resources for whatever its goals are. Its goals, okay, it's one thing to say it's powerful but might it not have positive goals? 
Well, potentially. What we would want is that the AI would have a tag where kill all humans is false and help all humans is true. Except, of course, the problem is that these are undefined. Um, and trying to define what these means is immensely complicated and prone to a lot of potential disasters. For instance, the goal of prevent human suffering, which sounds very nice and effective. How would an AI interpret this? Well, this is the single, kill all humans is the single fastest and best way of preventing human suffering. Okay, that's not what we meant, but it's what we said. So let's be a little bit more sophisticated. Keep humans safe and happy. Okay, I think you can see where this is going. This is entomb everyone in underground concrete coffins on heroin drips. And the AI will fight you if you try and prevent it from doing this because any other possibility, any other outcome, will not be the maximum of, uh, way of keeping humans safe and happy. And the AI may perfectly well understand this is not what we meant, but it has absolutely no reason to care. Now, some slightly more sophisticated versions um, have the AI deduce human preferences from observation uh, rather than trying to program them in. Now, this isn't, may not be quite as dangerous, but there's definitely a risk that if we unleash this and the AI takes it literally, that we get a future of the entire universe that sort of looks a bit like this. Anyway. I said that there were that uh, AI is a domain which is very difficult to predict. That's true, but you can say quite a lot more about how the AI might develop than about sort of specific timelines. This is what I'd call the simplified omohundro yudkowsky thesis: that behaving dangerously is a generic behavior for high intelligent AIs, um, for a variety of reasons to do with how the AI would. Uh, work on itself, um, how it's uh, with unclear goals, and how amassing power is almost always a good thing for the AI to do, whatever its goals, because it gives it a great chance of achieving its goals. And if, say, human safety is not fully programmed in, humans might just be an obstacle or a tool for the AI to achieve power for whatever goals it actually has. Now, this is sort of the simplified economic supply and demand equivalent um, it's a good starting point. Now you need to caveat a bit, which is that many AI designs have the potential for unexpected dangerous behavior. And with that claim, there goes a normative claim that AI programmers should demonstrate to moderate skeptics that the design is safe. Now, you might disagree with this thesis, um, even if it's caveated, refined and narrowed form, um, despite the evidence and the arguments there, but if you disagree, there's something very simple which you can do, which demonstrates to moderate skeptics that your design is safe. If your design does not pass this bar, then what are you doing messing around with it in the first place? But anyway, uh, to sort of summarize, of AIs, they're potentially extremely powerful. I don't want to uh, claim that it's certain that they will be, but there are great uncertainties here, and the great uncertainties cannot allow us to say that they won't be extremely powerful, but they're necessarily weak. The probability of them being extremely powerful is worryingly high. There's extreme uncertainties, as I've said. It's probably potentially inevitable. If AIs could be developed, uh, then with the commercial pressures and military competitive pressures, it's probable that someone might, that someone would, given that they can, in one country or in another. They're potentially extremely dangerous, as we've seen, um, and there are very few people working on a true AI safety. Um, there's some at the Future of Humanity Institute where I work, there's some at MIRI, which is a Californian group, and there's a few other scattered ones, but it is very small. And uh, so, I conclude this by pointing you to the websites of these organizations. 
Uh, I have a booklet called Smarter Than Us uh, that presents these arguments in a popularized form. Uh, Nick Bostrom, the head of my institute, has a much better and thicker book called Superintelligence, which I strongly recommend that you look at. And thanks for listening.